Hi, my name is Jody McNamer, uh, oftentimes referred to as Tyler's dad. Uh, from time to time, I will give you a father's perspective. As you know, my son is an international best-selling author and speaker on the topic of autism, uh, publishing a book, Population One, Autism, Adversity, and the Will to Succeed, and now his second book. Uh, so the topic I'm going to talk about today is understanding a person without autism. And Tyler and I talk a lot about this because we concentrate so much on trying to understand a person with autism. And oftentimes, uh, that perspective for us, we're, we're constantly as parents searching for all of this information that we can get on what it's like to have autism. And I think that's really been the success of my son's company is that he does allow people to understand what it's like to have autism from a first person perspective because he can recall all those things from when he was very, very young and not being able to speak and being frustrated and the reason why he melted down um, and having to deal with all the stimulus and all of those things that came with being a nonverbal six year old and then really starting to uh, find his words and sentences at about 12. And now he speaks to, you know, tens of thousands of people across the uh, uh, across the nation. And if you had asked me as a dad um, if my son would have, you know, spoke in front of tens of thousands of people, while I would believe that my son could do anything because I'm a dad, um, you know, there were some pretty significant issues. And I would say that the odds were greatly against that. And that taught me a huge lesson um, in being a dad because when I uh, first received the diagnosis, you know, that Tyler had autism. Um, it was kind of like a bomb went off. I immediately tried to come up with all these things, right, to, to fix him. And, and I actually spent a lot of years trying to fix my son. And the reality of it was is that my son actually didn't need to be fixed at all. Uh, he just needed a dad um, and he needed somebody there to support him and love him. And while I feel like I did a good job as a father supporting him, it really was about creating a framework for him, getting uh, counselors and speech therapists and working with the school, right? That somehow I felt like uh, really was what I needed to be doing as a father because we just kind of want to get in and fix things. But there's a whole other component of that, which is just being and accepting Tyler for who he was. And I think that's my coaching to parents is that while it is important to create a structure, uh, have and work with the schools on their IEPs and making sure that they have a good speech therapists and occupational therapists and counselors and other things, it's equally as important to make sure that they understand that uh, you accept them for exactly who they are and exactly who they are not. Um, and you know they may have behaviors that uh, in the context of the way that we were raised are different. But I also believe that, you know, society as a whole is actually changing. Um, and with Tyler, we used a system of, you know, acceptable, unacceptable, unaccept expected, and unexpected. And um, I think it's really, really important to make sure, again, that that framework is parents in that they understand what was expected and what's not expected uh, as far as behavior and also framework and rules in a household, but also what really is acceptable and unacceptable. Uh, because we do have to create this framework, these boundaries of which then our children uh, feel safe. But on this topic of understanding someone who doesn't have autism, if you can change for just a moment your perspective and ask yourself, well, how do our children with autism see us? How do they see people that don't have autism? Could it be that they look at us as someone that has a disability? Uh, could they look at us because we don't have the ability to process visually as fast as they can, see or hear or touch or smell as many things as they can at the rate they can? Would they look at us as being potentially disabled because we don't have the ability to do that? Perhaps their ability to be able to communicate in different ways. Uh, my son uh, had um, 
this uncanny ability uh, to be able uh, to be a very calming influence and develop actually very close relationships with pets, um, dogs and our cats. And actually we had chickens and he was one of the only ones that could actually go into the chicken coop and while the chickens run away, they actually would be attracted to him. So do they see it as abnormal that we can't develop those relationships or be able to communicate with other creatures uh, in the way that they can? Uh, do they look at us as being disabled because we cannot produce the type of art that they can, uh, the type of music that they can, their uncanny ability to be able to really uh, parrot or create the same sounds as another person, duplicating them, remembering things. Do they look at us that way? Um, can they understand or not understand why we aren't that way? So if for a moment you put yourself into their shoes, um, it most likely will help you with perspective because they could also be looking at us as the same way that we are looking at them. And it allows us to have a huge amount of compassion because quite frankly, there's not one of us that doesn't deal with something that we would call um, expected or unexpected or acceptable or unacceptable, even in our own personal lives. Think about our habits. Uh, habits really are neither good nor bad. They just are. Um, and being able to understand though how our habits formed and maybe we're trying to modify some of those habits. Well, same things apply to our children too. Maybe they've developed habits that aren't the best for them, uh, but somehow those habits filled a need for them. Uh, same thing, our habits ultimately fill our needs. And uh, at the time, uh, that's how we created that habit. But maybe our situation has changed so we can retrain ourselves to that, those habits um, and get rid of what we would classify as the bad habits and then uh, move those to habits that would be uh, suitable for our current situation. Well, the same is true with our children. Um, our ability to help them transform from habits that maybe uh, were ingrained because they really needed that when they were young and processing sensory like rocking or pulling their hair or, you know, twisting, uh, you know, or um, you know, fidgets or other stems, those were the ways that they coped, but maybe they no longer need those things, but they've become habits. So do they look at us as having those habits? And are we providing an example of how we train ourselves uh, for different um, habits? And then being able to also set the example of how they can do the same thing. So to the extent that we are understanding and compassionate and patient, um, that really is gonna go a long way in developing our relationship with our child. Um, and don't get me wrong, I have a huge amount of compassion and, and literally when you're just hanging on with your fingernails and it's just really your last fingernail of your last finger, you know, because your child is screaming with this shrill shrieking that just is its only form of communication or is, eating staples or up on the desk or getting kicked out of school or headbunting other kids. I, I get it. Um, that's where Tyler was. Um, and it, it's easy now because I, I know where Tyler's at, but I have a huge amount of compassion and it's still just as painful um, of, of a memory going through as a father and, and his mother. Um, so again, a hu huge amount of compassion on that. But one of the things that we learned now that I really wish I would have known then was to just never, 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 never quit. Never quit. Uh, because our children are so worth it. The contribution that our children with autism have to give to this world is extraordinary. It's our jobs as parents to be able to find that unique ability, to be able to find the things that that area that they are so extraordinary in and really be able to help them nurture that and leverage that so that they get to share that with the world. And what a wonderful thing that is because I'm confident that we have not even begun to see the world that actually can be created with their minds the way that they see the world. It's us actually 
that need to be um, understood. Their world is just fine the way that it is. So could it be that they are trying to understand someone with autism as we're trying to understand, uh, without autism, as we're trying to understand someone with autism?